Hello Xers and Interwebbers. Welcome to another episode of Naive in the 90s, the podcast. My name is Emily and I'm your host. I was a 70s baby, an 80s kid, and a 90s troublemaker. Let's just get into it. So for today's show, we're going to do stuff a little bit different. Um, Up until now, we've just really been kind of talking about my book, um, Naive in the 90s, which is a creative nonfiction and available on Amazon. So we've been talking about that. And then um, we've been reconnecting with some of those characters slash my real life um, high school friends. And we've also talked about, you know, just my experiences and this and that. We did also do a um, an episode on um, favorite movies and TV shows from the 80s and 90s, so I thought maybe we would just expand on that one a little bit because I do tend to um, bring up my so-called life in multiple episodes in, you know, comparably multiple ways to my life and um just in general how much of an impact that show was and I believe it's next year it will be its 30th anniversary so just just to go on that I figured we would explore the show and possibly do each episode of my so-called life as an episode, a breakdown episode for the podcast. Um, I don't know. We'll see how today goes and then we'll go from there. The show was 19 episodes and it started in August of 1994 and it went into, um, 1995. Um, there were supposed to be 22 episodes according to wiki which is interesting because we did only get 19 and I really wonder what those other three episodes were supposed to be about um I don't know it's it's kind of sad that we didn't get those three it's sad in general that we didn't get you know more um seasons because the show was groundbreaking at the time And when I say groundbreaking, it is for, um, you know, a couple different reasons. And one of them was that there weren't really many shows, especially dramas, that um, were centered around girls and teenage girls at that. Um, Most shows were definitely more boy centric and really cared about their perspective and the girls in the shows would be more of like I don't know um a side character or like you know a love interest or whatever like think Kelly Kapowski and you know Brenda Walsh and you know Kelly Taylor, those were really the type of girls that we got in the 90s. Um, I did forget though, we did have Clarissa Explains It All. Um, definitely was not a drama. 100% was um, a comedy and just episodic and just, yeah, it was teenage girl, but it was kind of like goofy teenage girl um, and not very realistic at all. But I mean, it, it was decent. Um, in the 80s, it was even worse than that. It was like, you know, Alyssa Milano in Who's the Boss? And I don't know her real name, uh, Tracy Gold in um, Growing Pains, um, you know, They were just, they were side characters. They did get episodes to themselves where, you know, there were maybe some important things going on. 
But for the most part, most TV, especially those geared for the younger kids um, and the teenagers, were definitely boy-centric. One of the, um, well, the main writer, uh, Winnie Holtzman, who actually was a co-writer for the musical Wicked, which I think is pretty awesome, um, she said in an interview with CNN that they, the co-creators or the producers, Marshall Herkowitz and Ed Swick, um, quote, said to me, if you were to write a teenage girl that was really real and that we didn't try to stereotype or make perfect, it was there giving me permission to be honest and that was empowering. So that was super cool. Like the whole point was to get a girl. And at that time, there just, you know, again, there just really wasn't any girls um, f up front. And from there, Winnie Holtzman um, started with her diary, and she wrote from her own high school experiences and memories. Now, she didn't write her own story. She just used her diaries to go back into that frame of mind. Herkovich said about this, and quote, it's not like she was doing herself. What she was doing was the sensibility that I think every sensitive, introspective person has when they go through adolescence. And I think that that's really, you know, a big point of this show and why it connected and resonated with so many people. And even though it was only one season, it still made a huge impact. And Winnie Holtzman on the whole thing said that, you know, we felt that it was time for a teenage girl to come front and center. And, you know, it was time. Even in the show, um, that is very apparent. Like, the character Brian says about Angela, I'm not sure what episode this was, but he says, and quote, she's not just a fantasy. She's got like flaws. She's real, end quote. So that I think, you know, had a lot to do with, again, how much this connected and resonated with people, um, especially girls of the time, because um, <laughs> if you were a teenage girl in the 90s, especially, you know, the early mid 90s, you know that uh, society was very, very much geared towards boys. And I don't mean that we girls were, you know, not thought of, but I think we were, I don't know, we were thought up as different. Um, I I hesitate to say second class citizens because I don't know if that's right, but it is kind of like that. Like the boys were the king of the school. Um they were kings of society. Um and I don't think that it's it's a I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because it's not bad. We should be lifting our our kids up, our boys up, and letting them know that they can do anything. But at the same time, um, we can lift up one group without holding back another group. We can lift everyone up, you know? So... I don't know. Um, yeah. And then the other thing about the show that was pretty, pretty different from other shows was that it really kind of just looked at sm not small scale things because when it's your life, it's pretty big. Um, but it kind of just looked at, you know, how people felt 
and like how teenagers felt, specifically teenage girls, although not just them because, you know, we get into Brian and Ricky and even Jordan. And um, I don't know, it was it wasn't like it was packed with action. There wasn't, you know, a death or a mystery. There wasn't even, you know, car chases or, you know, big dramatic events. It was really about how these kids felt and even how the parents felt and how life can just really be a lot. Um, Trunkworthy said in an article, it's teenagers aren't lumped into lazy high school stereotypes, nerd, stoner, jock, slut. They're complex composites of you and me and everyone we know. Like us, their problems aren't neatly packaged in 60-minute solvables. Their beauties and flaws intertwine and unfold across the entire series. And that was something, too, because, you know, um, TV a lot of times would just be episodic. So it would be the same characters. The characters would change slightly and whatnot, or their relationships would change or you know continue to grow but really the issues of each episode were taken care of in each episode that's a big difference that there was with my so-called life is that it wasn't episodic things that happened in you know episode one were not taken care of by the end they were still being talked about in episode seven, you know, um, that in itself is kind of true to life because nothing we go through gets cleaned up that easy. And, um, I think that that really, really made a big difference. And that's why to the, this day, um, the show continues to pick up viewers and fans and connect with youth due to its realistic characters, its situations, its dialogue, you know, it really, it just connects. And it's really sad we didn't get more because I think we could have, we could have um, addressed bigger, bigger things that people were going through at the time. So co-producer slash creator, um, Marshall Herkovich said, quote, Trying to do a television show from inside of a person's experience was a pretty new thing. Television was externalized in a very particular way. And having the subjective point of view of this girl that was not afraid to show her pain, to show her terror, that sort of thing, was very new on television. And I think in a certain way, ahead of its time. End quote. And I think, you know... That's super, super true and kind of what I've been babbling about um, to get to the point of. So my so-called life um, took place in the suburbs of Pittsburgh. The Chase family was a basic middle class family, um, definitely a, you know, white bread neighborhood and family and school it aired on thursday nights against bigger shows those included like friends living single man about you and those were huge like those were huge huge and thursday was the biggest biggest of the nights for tv which is weird um i don't know why that is but it is so that was, you know, part of its demise. That and along with, um, it just, it was new. It was different. It was about a girl. It was about high schoolers. So it really had some hard competition. And um, also I've seen a complaint that people seem to say that it was just a slower pace, which, 
yeah, again, like I mentioned before, there weren't, you know, car crashes or chases. There weren't, you know, a murder or big mystery that needed to be solved. There wasn't some sort of huge drama that was, you know, a huge cliffhanger at the end of every episode. What it was, was just realness, real people. And I think that, you know, that supposed slow pace um, wasn't really a slow pace. It was more that people just didn't, I don't know, they weren't, maybe they just weren't deep enough to connect to it i know that sounds horrible but uh, i don't know guys like it's a really really good show and it was really poignant and i have just started rewatching it full disclosure um i did watch it the first time around when it came out and then years and years and years ago i mean like years ago i rewatched it um, I don't even remember on what it was on something, and I rewatched it. I don't actually remember a lot of it. Um, but yeah, so I started rewatching it. I've gotten through the first episode so far, and um, it's it's got a lot of stuff that needed to be talked about, especially at the time, and. Um, kids need to be able to know that they can talk about these things and not be treated like it's unimportant, which, you know, saying that this was a slow pace and it, it just wasn't exciting enough, kind of like tells everyone that like your stuff isn't important and I don't think that's true and I feel like maybe that's why so many later Gen X and millennials the older millennials kind of have that like it is what it is oh well kind of attitude we'll just deal with it ourselves it's because this is the type of attitude that was around that these small-scale events weren't dramatic enough, weren't entertaining enough, and that's a really, really sad lesson for, you know, a whole clump of generations to learn, and I don't know, it makes me sad. So, it was canceled after, you know, one season, um, which sucks to be honest with you um but even with the low ratings that it did get on abc i believe it was um the show actually won a few awards claire danes won a golden globe for the best actress in a television series drama i mean that's not any small feat and you have to remember that she was only 13 when this project started um by the time it was done and by the time she won the award she was 15 but you know that's huge and that says a lot for the show and for her performance and then it won a couple of the youth in film awards one was Best Performance by a Youth Ensemble in a TV Series, which, yes, because all of those actors on there, they were all amazing, and they really, you know, captured those characters and portrayed them with just such heartfelt, just vigor. I just, oh, they were just all so amazing. And then um, Lisa uh Lisa Whiteholt I don't know um I don't know how to say names I'm sorry but Lisa Whiteholt um who played Danielle tied for best performance by a youth actress in a drama series which is pretty freaking cool too I mean Danielle wasn't in my opinion really even like a huge character yeah she was there she was definitely you know um a little little annoyance to Angela but she 
and you know she was the comedy relief a lot um when the show was a little too dramatic danielle would come in with a breath of fresh air and just kind of be spunky and sassy and i think we really would have loved to seen where that character went um so yeah the high school that so here's some random facts the high school that they recorded in um which was liberty high in pittsburgh was actually a high school in LA and it was also used in Arrested Development, Seventh Heaven, and Joan of Arcadia. So if you recognize it, that's why. And um this is kind of crazy. Alicia Silverstone, um the girl from Clueless and the Aerosmith videos back in the day, was actually considered to play the role of Angela. But they passed on her because she didn't fit the image that they actually wanted for Angela. Basically, she was, quote, too pretty and not awkward enough. Um, And that's, like, I can see that because she is. She is gorgeous. Not saying that Claire Danes isn't gorgeous, but Alicia Silverstone, as soon as she appeared on the scene, she was just above and beyond. Like, everyone thought she was beautiful or wanted to be her or wanted to date her or just hang out with her and be her friend. It would be just about a year later that she would play Cher in Clueless. So it it worked out. I just don't think it would have been the same or right with her as Angela. Um, I just keep hearing that share of like, as if, (laughs) and like, no. (laughs) Um, another crazy thing is that AJ Langer, who played Rayanne, actually auditioned to be Angela, but thankfully she was instead cast as Rayanne, which I think she was perfect as. I always admired her. I thought she was so gorgeous and her hair was so awesome. She just had this, this air about her that just, oh, she's amazing. Amazing. (laughs) Um, but yeah, so, and then another crazy thing is that, um, Jordan Catalano, the character, was only supposed to be in one episode, the pilot. And I wonder how that was going to work. Were they going to be like, oh, look at this hot boy. Angela really likes him. And then he's just never to be seen again. Like, okay. <laughs> um, but after seeing his performance for the the pilot, Winnie Holtzman said, quote we knew he needed to be a continuing character so everyone just saw jared leto and was like wow he he's beautiful so yes yes please (laughs) and um yeah so another another super cool thing that i thought was really neat was that ricky um was the first gay high school character on u.s network tv and i mean that that's a lot i think that that's a lot um that's history in the making and what's super cool is that i remember in high school you know we were i was in my senior year when it came out it at that point it wasn't a big deal to see a gay character Because we had, you know, in the 80s, it was weird. Um, And I know that sounds so horrible. Um, But yeah, in the 80s, you know, being gay was looked at as a bad thing and a thing that you should hide and a thing you should be ashamed of, which is really, really sad. Um, There was you know, there was a lot of, lot of issues with AIDS and then just people who were scared and they were taking it out on the gay community. And it just, it was a really, really scary time to be honest with you. Um, 
I'm actually really glad that I grew up in the, you know, latter part of that so that, like, gay was normal. Gay was normal for us. Um, in fact, um, one of my, if you read the book or if you've listened to um, past episodes, our friend Chris, um, she she was bisexual and she told us in 10th grade that that was that was a thing and i will i will admit at first it was cuz again you know this is the very early 90s um it was it was a shock to a lot of people and it even became um a point of bullying to her that um you know the news got out there was a conversation overheard by some people um and it got out and people started picking on her the um administration like the principal and the vice principal and the guidance they all got involved and a bunch of us were called down and she actually left school for a while um over it because she was getting so bullied which is really sad and i i i'm thankful that that was really the last personally the last time that um someone i know who came out was really really like messed with um although if again if you've listened to the podcast or have read the book um you do know that one of one of the characters um slash people that we grew up with chunk um also known as charles or charlie now um there was a lot of issues when they came out of the closet and it wasn't even coming out it was more they would wear short shorts and eyeliner and um they got picked on really really bad um i think it was a little bit more than just that there was also a lot of drugs and just assholes around um but yeah so other than those two though i I really can't think of anyone in particular that had a hard time coming out or being accepted finally, which is nice because I know it was way more widespread um, than than we probably even saw, which is super sad because who cares? Who cares who loves who or who's attracted to who? As long as it's not a kid or an animal, like have fun it's consenting have fun i i i really don't understand why people have such a hang up with who people love or who people make love to it's it's really no one's concern and before anyone jumps in about you know the bible says i i literally don't care <laughs> like i i'm sorry and i'm sure some people will get upset about that but I'm not Catholic. I'm not Christian. I was Catholic for a very long time. I went through all of the steps all the way up through confirmation because I was in a family that that's what you did. And I've said it before. I think 17, 16, 17 is way too young to be devoting your soul, making some kind of soul pack to anybody, any, any religion. I I just, I don't agree with it. And, um, any religion that decides that it should dictate by an old book that was rewritten hundreds of years and hundreds and hundreds of years later after the supposed facts happened, like, I just, no, I'm sorry. But like, you know, you want to, you want to believe in whatever you go right ahead. Just don't try to force that onto other people that's stupid and I just no so um yeah (laughs) yeah I uh oh 
no, no, now I've gone off on a squirrel brain tangent and I'm just mad about <laughs> the inequality and the fact that we're still to this day, you know, like being gay or being bi or being trans and or being anything that isn't you know, heteronormative is looked at as some horrible political issue. And it just, it really boils my blood. Like, really, 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 really. So yeah, um, having Ricky be the first, you know, openly gay um, teenager on TV was huge. And it really, it really bothers me to think that it is possible that that was part of the reason that um the show didn't do so good and it's like so you don't like teenage girls and having them be honest and upfront and emotional and vulnerable okay you don't like people being gay and just there okay well that kind of says a lot about you <laughs> So some other, because I just went off on a tangent, I'm just going to jump back into um, some other random stuff before I get down into what I got out of the first episode. Um, Winnie Holtzman, the writer, uh, she actually has a cameo in one of the episodes. It's called Father Figure. It is not the first one, so... I will report back to that, but I thought that was kind of cool. Um, she played a teacher, so if you're going to watch it, look for Mrs. Krizanowski, Um, which, you know, cool, cool, cool. And um, another weird little fact, which I don't know, I guess I can't comment on this right away because I've, again, I've only rewatched the first one. Um, I've seen the series twice through, but it's been at least a decade, if not more, since the very last time I watched it. Um, Graham, Angela's dad, was named one of TV Guide's top 50 dads of all time in 2014. And he was actually number 49, so I guess that makes it a little bit better because he was like almost at the bottom. But like... Ooh, I don't know if I agree with that. He kind of sucked, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, I will say this first episode, he seems okay. Like, he's kind of on Angela's side. He's more passive about things. He's a little bit more, you know, tolerant of everything teenager. But also, at the same time, even in that first episode, I have, I already have problems with him. And I will get into that because I it skeeved me out, to be honest. And ugh. But I do know later on in the show, he gets weird with his co-owner or owner of whatever restaurant he ends up opening. Um, I don't really remember too much other than she chewed really weird like there was a lot of aggressive chewing on her part and it really bothered me the first time I watched it and the second time I watched it through and I'm already dreading watching her chew now <laughs> like <ugh. laughs> um but yeah so I have a lot to say on that I don't think he was a top 50 father I I actually I kind of feel like him being a top 50 father kind of either shows that we have really low standards um, or we just aren't showing good fathers. We aren't portraying men in a good fatherly way in entertainment because I feel like Graham got on that list because he wasn't an alcoholic. He wasn't abusive. He didn't, like, do anything overly, overly, like, aggressive or bad at the kids. He was just kind of a dick. He was kind of selfish. And I get it. He had been taking care of his family for however many years 
um, along with his wife, Patty, who was also definitely doing things to take care of the family. And as someone who's in middle age, I get it. Like, you know, all of a sudden you look there and your life has passed you by by decades and you look around and you're like, wow, I haven't done a bunch of the things I wanted to do or needed to do for myself. And you kind of feel lost. But I don't think that to find yourself or to find your peace, um, I don't think you need to negate your family or your obligation to them. I just... There's a balance, and I kind of just, I don't know. Graham's not my favorite, so that's weird. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so when the show was canceled, interestingly enough, um, the internet was fairly new, and, like, the internet itself had been around, but it being in, you know, homes and being used for personal private use was was still pretty new. I will say Herskovitz on the cancellation years later he he said that the networks didn't understand that you could sell adolescent girls. And again that comes back to people just weren't ready or cared enough what girls thought or what they went through to like the show, which is awful. <laughs> it, it's just awful. But after the cancellation a bunch of female, younger female-centric shows did start popping up. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Gilmore Girls, Felicity, The O.C., Daria, Freaks and Geeks, One Tree Hill, like there were a ton of them. And it is because of my so-called life. Even the producers and the creators agree with this. So, When it got canceled, rightly so, a bunch of people were very upset. Not only was it a great show that resonated um, with so many, but also it was left on a cliffhanger. What was Angela going to do? Was she going to go with Jordan, who had betrayed her, with Rayanne, or was it was she going to go with Brian, you know, the boy next door who had been her friend through all of childhood, who clearly was in love with her. And it ended there. And rightly so, everyone who watched it was very upset. So even though the internet was fairly new, um, and most regular homes really didn't have it, One of the first, if not the first, online fan campaign took place trying to save it from cancellation, which is super cool. The protest, or the campaign, whatever you want to call it, was called Operation Life Support. And the people who were in it and, like, doing the stuff, they called themselves lifers. But, you know, again, the internet wasn't wasn't big, and so it it didn't really it didn't really go far but aside from the small online campaign fans also wrote to abc with letters of protest trying to save it or at least get just a second season or even just a made for tv movie to wrap it up just to give us that ending that we needed But with low ratings and apparently the fact that some of the main cast wasn't sure that they wanted to return. And this is most notably Claire Danes herself. Her and her parents just, they weren't sure that they wanted her to go back. And when that happened, Winnie Holtzman and the rest of the the producers, they just gave up. They were like, well, if... Angela isn't going to be there or doesn't want to be there, then what's the point? And I mean, I get it. But also, oh, God, that would have been amazing. I just, you know, just even just those last three episodes that we were supposed to get, I feel like would have made a huge difference. The one cool thing, I I mean, I don't know if it's the cool thing, but um, there is a 
book series. And it is based on on Angela and on the show. Apparently, it is um, a two-book series, but only the second one um, really has shown up. I can't even find the first one, to be honest with you. And it's supposedly an Angela Chase series written by Catherine Clark. And um, the second one is the one that I guess everyone cares about. Again, the only one I could find. It's called My So-Called Life Goes On. It was published in 1999 and it picks up the summer after the end of the show. So school ends and now we're into summer. And what now I don't have the book and I don't see myself getting the book because apparently this book is in high demand. It goes from anywhere from like a hundred to $250 on average. I've seen lower. The lowest I've seen was $88 and then it's gone higher. And the highest I've seen was five. It was listed for $500, which is crazy, like crazy, crazy. But it does continue the story. And so we kind of know what happens a little bit um which I guess gives can give fans a little solace um Angela does end up with Jordan in the book um he he wins her back and they are doing their thing (laughs) um Angela is also working at her father's restaurant and Apparently, I guess Sharon is still with Kyle. Now, I haven't, again, I haven't rewatched the whole series, but that that's a thing. So I guess Sharon and Kyle are on the outs at the end of the, I, I don't really remember. Sharon wasn't really my favorite character. I know she is to some, but um, I don't know. I, I kind of found her annoying, <laughs> so I, I just apparently blocked that out. But um. What's interesting is um, Winnie Holtzman has come forward in a couple interviews and talked about how she did have plans for the next season, that there were going to be things um, that were going to happen. And some of the stuff was, you know, Graham and Patty were going to be divorced and Patty was going to... um, Patty was going to suffer from severe depression. And because of that severe depression, Angela was going to have to kind of step into a motherly role for not only her her little sister, Danielle, but also for her mother. Um, so that would have been crazy interesting. And then um, Holtzman also mentioned that she wanted someone to get pregnant and felt it probably would have been Sharon. And I'll tell you, as soon as I read that she had thought someone was going to need to be pregnant in the series, I also thought of Sharon because, you know, she's supposedly the goody goody, but she also has, you know, a long term boyfriend who she is intimate with. So it just it just kind of made sense, especially because like, you know, Angela wasn't wasn't doing that stuff. And then Rayan her her character already kind of had had the addict arc going. So it, I mean, yeah, I I know plenty of people who who partied and who um would probably be considered alcoholics as well that got pregnant and you know whatever but i feel like for tv um that just would have been way too much so that that was going to be a thing um she definitely she also said that graham was definitely going to have an affair with haley the the big chewer and seriously, if you rewatch the show, just watch how that woman chews. It's it's so aggressive and it's it's so bothersome. I oh god, I hate it so much. <laughs> um, but yeah, so here we have Graham doing, you know, his restaurant stuff, doing his midlife crisis thing. Got a new lady, and then 
Patty, who was going through this really bad depression, not getting out of bed, whatever. And then what was going to happen was something was going to happen to Ricky that forced Patty out of her funk and into action. And, um, you know, from what I remember, Ricky was was headed towards some some sad stuff just because of um people not accepting him and he was homeless and just it it was bad it was bad um but yeah so she also mentioned that we would we would have seen Jordan winning Angela back and Brian and Delia hooking up but that Brian and Angela would still actually be pulled together. They would still have that pull, that something underneath that was kind of like, why are we with these other people? Maybe we should really be with each other. And I think, you know, I think that would, that tracks, (laughs) you know? Um, Yeah. What's also funny, I guess, is that Holtzman and... Danes, Claire Danes. Um, they are actually still friends in real life. And she said that um Winnie Holtzman said that her and Claire have actually um joked about how eventually Angela would end up as a CIA agent, which if you watch Claire Danes's home that I suppose is funny. <laughs> I don't watch it. I never have. Um, but you know, that's that's kind of cool, I guess. <laughs> so one of the characters in my so-called life is Tino, who and he Tino is frequently mentioned and part of the things that are going on, all of the hijinks, all of the everything. Like if there's trouble happening, a party, something going on, Tino is involved. But the funny thing is, is throughout the series, and this is um, documented in a whole bunch of things too, he is never seen. That character, you, you, ne- you literally never see him, which is funny because he he was kind of a big part of some of the plot devices and I don't know I find it funny and um I don't think I'm the only one cuz um in the movie Juno um there's a quote that actually calls back or references to Tino um and that we never saw him but that he was always around and it was Polly or Michael Sarah and he says, once Tino gets a new drum head, we're just like ready to rock. <laughs> I don't know. I think that that's funny because it's always in the in the show. It's always about Tino's going to get this or Tino can get us into here or, you know, Tino heard of this party or whatever the case may be. And in in my so-called life, they use like a lot and pause in their their dialogue and it's just it's it's funny that in Juno they had Polly basically do the same thing and um you know it's like funny (laughs) um yeah so um a couple other things that I I noticed going through all of these different articles and um just you know doing some just basic research on the show Um, I did notice there was a lot of like Brian versus Jordan and why doesn't she, Angela, like the good guy and like that is the big argument online still, you know, almost 30 years later and it's really easy to say when it's on paper or on a screen in front of you and it's not you dealing with those thoughts, those emotions, and, you know, all of that stuff, um, to be like, oh, this is clearly the better pick for me. This person is, you know, more sound, more committed, you know, nicer, and that's in air quotes, um, you know, because, because Brian did have his, his crap too, and 
even the nicest people are not without their faults. Like, we are all the villain in someone's story, even if we don't understand it. Um, but, but yeah, so I just, I think that's a really weird and kind of messed up way to look at things. Like, why didn't she pick Brian? Because he's nicer, you know? And it's like, that's not how attraction and how love and, you know, any of that stuff works. We follow our heart and, you know, our hormones and whatever. And not to mention, these people specifically that we're talking about, they're teenagers. So they're, you know, their decision making, their consequences, their frontal lobe there that does, that's in charge of all of that is not fully developed. It doesn't do the things. It it only, you know, your brain is only really getting the information of I see something or feel something and I want that and that's what it wants. Um you know, matters of the heart and of the body are rarely logical. Like it just, so I find it funny that, you know, so many people have that going on. Like, sure, it's really easy to like say these things, but when put into the situation, that's not, that's, that's just, it's not reality. That's just not how it works. So yeah, dumb. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's just that some random stuff about the show itself. And um, now let's get into the first episode and the things that I guess I picked up on or just had thoughts about. I did take notes. I watched the first episode and I literally had a notepad and a pen and I paused along the way so I could make sure to get all the good stuff because it's, I don't know, I've got thoughts on it. So let's see. So episode one of My So-Called Life came out um, August 25th in 1994 and it's it's just it's a good show um if you haven't seen it I totally totally recommend it and I'm just gonna point out little things or bring up stuff that I don't know I noticed the first thing I noticed was when Angela is doing her voiceover it's still and I'm a 46 year old woman and I still get transported to that time. Um, my brain and my heart immediately go back to high school. Just from her starting to describe how it is being her and being a teen. And one of her comments was about how boys had it so easy. And how girls needed to pretend that we didn't notice the boys noticing us. And that is so true there was like a fine line that we walked and um for lack of a better way of explaining it it was kind of like the lady in the streets and then a freak in the sheets <laughs> thing um you know because we still needed to be you know good nice girls and we you know if we had any hope of a relationship with anyone we needed to be someone that they could bring home and we grew up in a very you know white just basic people <laughs> like the the stereotype of this the the white suburbs um so you know we needed to Classy isn't the right word, but we needed to be respectful to the outside world. But at the same time, um, we still needed to be able to flirt and be coy with the boys, but not overly because then, you know, you were branded just horribly because um, then you were just like, 
you know, the girl that tried too hard or threw herself at people. So you did. You had to, like, let them know that, well, let them believe that they were the ones running the show. Sometimes they were because, you know, we did grow up in a very masculine dominated time. Um, but we all, the us girls, we weren't dumb. We knew looks. We knew the way that we were posturing to them, the way they were posturing to us. Um, yeah, we were probably oblivious to a lot of attention or whatnot. Um, definitely naive to a bunch of it as well. But a lot of it did not go unnoticed. And I just thought that that was interesting that she brought that up. And I thought it was also funny, um, you know, she dyed her hair as her rebellion and she's like, they're like, her parents are like, oh, you know, the red hair. And she's like, um, it's not red. Or her sister says something about it being red. And she's like, it's crimson glow. <laughs> I remember being the same way because I did the same thing. I went and got vampire, I think it was vampire red. I think that's what it was called. But it was vampire something. I believe it was vampire red um, in Manic Panic. And I did my hair and it wasn't red because it had red with purple undertones. And I was very proud of those purple undertones. So I didn't want anyone to like just call it red. Because Red was like Ronald McDonald and Bozo the Clown and, you know, Strawberry Shortcake. And I wanted Vampire. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, within the first seven minutes, it did get a little, a little weird and cringy for me. And I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I this is part of my problem with Graham. Um, that I mentioned earlier about him being like one of the top 50 TV dads of all time. And this, this was just, it was pretty disturbing to me personally. Um, I didn't see anyone else anywhere while I was doing my research online talk about this, but so the dad is like bumbling around when Angela and he pass each other in the hallway. And she's coming out of the bathroom. She's got a towel wrapped around her as one wraps a towel around them when getting out of the shower. Yes, her shoulders are showing. Yes, the very tippity top of her chest, not her, not her breasts, but the top of her shoulders and chest are showing. Um, but this is her, her father and she's going from the bathroom to the bedroom and he ends up being like bumbling like fully bumbling like can't remember who Anne Frank is he's dropping stuff in his arms he's acting like he's never talked to this person before and she's just talking and having a conversation with him and mind you he is the one that like asked her how things were going so he delayed her from fully going into her room which shouldn't have been a case anyways but so after all of this bumbling and dropping of things and forgetting of words and forgetting of big historical people he then proceeds to go into the bedroom and tell the mom patty that she needs to tell angela to stop walking around in a towel or that she needs a bigger towel. And her towel was just a normal bath towel, like a normal one. And it was fully cut. And I just like, what the fuck? Like, why is his daughter being sexualized by him for just doing what she's always done? And like, just, oh, it, it flusters me so much because it's ridiculous. It's like, <sighs> I don't know. He just, it, it's just gross. I find it super, super gross that like this show, this, this script, whatever made it. And I get that they were trying to, you know, convey that Angela growing up, no longer being a young, a young girl, but being a teenager on 
you know, the cusp of womanhood. And she even says, you know, her that <clears throat> her and her father used to be um, closer, but then her breasts got in between them. And I get that that's the point. And just having her say that would have been fine. Having them even have an awkward conversation would have been fine. But it just seemed very over-sexualizing of someone who's been in his house every single day for the last 15 years. And it's just, it was overblown. And I really, it really, really made me uncomfortable. And then also, I another part that was, you know, soon after that, um, another scene that I thought was super, super weird was the hyper fixation of the teacher. I think she was um, maybe the English, I think the English teacher, but um, she was also the yearbook committee teacher. And it was like a hyper fixation that her bra strap was falling off of her shoulder and that she tucked it back in and like okay I get that it was like when it was a Brian centric part of the scene where Brian was noticing that this female attractive younger teacher's bra strap was falling I get that that would have made perfect and fine sense. Like, yes, he's a young boy. He is now, you know, noticing women. He thinks this, this woman in front of him is, is beautiful and attractive and sexy. Cool. But then they have Angela also comment and fixate on it. And I just, I, as a, a woman and who was a girl and, you know, at that time in high school no, who what maybe my parents would say something maybe the teacher would say something if a student's bra strap was falling down like maybe and i'm saying like i'm i never like my parents maybe my grandmother maybe but like never was it like a deal like i just it just i don't know it just seemed like a really weird, it just seemed weird. Like, again, if it had stopped with Brian, it would have made sense and it would have been perfectly fine. And I would have never even brought it up. It wouldn't have even stuck in my mind that it was something strange, but it was that it was Brian, you know, the camera, then Brian, and then Angela as well. And it just, no, no. No, in 1994, no one under the age of 40 cared about your bra strap. Like, just no. So what was cool in that scene, um, I'm going to bring up a quote because it was, it really, like, it struck me in the feels. And, like, I definitely, like, it resonated then and it still resonates now. So Angela... After, you know, meeting Rayanne and starting to hang out with her and Ricky, she changes her hair and then she also quits yearbook committee, which uh, it was a big part of her life until then. And when the teacher, the English teacher, um, asks her about, you know, why this all is happening, the change of appearance, the change of friends, the changing of activities... This is Angela's answer, and I just think it's amazing. So she says, It just seems like you agree to have a certain personality or something for no reason, just to make things easier for everyone. But when you think about it, I mean, how do you even know if it's even you? And I mean, this whole thing with the yearbook It's like everyone's in this big hurry to make this book to supposedly remember what happened, but it's, it's not even what really happened. It's what everybody thinks was supposed to happen. Because if you made a book of what really happened, it'd be a really upsetting book. And I just, wow, cause yeah. And the thing is, is not only was I like, wow hearing her say that and like 
Yes, because again, at 46, do we even know who we are? You know, so many of us, and I know so many women go through this. In their 40s, they just, you know, they stop giving a shit. They start doing things for themselves. And maybe it's a midlife crisis. Maybe instead of, you know, having an affair with a younger woman or a younger person or buying that red car or whatever the stereotype for men are, like maybe for women, it's we are here trying to figure out who we are. And it's just, it really, it really struck me because we've been doing this forever like since we were teenagers and Angela saying that just like really kind of like brought that to the forefront that we have we've been like you know fighting to know who we are and to be who we are and to discover who we are for our entire lives and like are there people out there that are just just know who they are and are just like unabashedly themselves <laughs> and then I'm like oh god yes there are and most of those people like they're doing probably pretty good even if people don't like them you know like I see some people who are definitely themselves and they give no fucks about what anyone else thinks and everyone kind of thinks they're assholes and like maybe they are but also at the same time aren't they kind of free because they're just being them I I would rather it not be like ooh, only assholes are like that <laughs> but i mean yeah like jerks and then like people who are shunned and how sad is that like i don't know because like you're either kind of a jerk face jerk if you're just a unabashedly yourself or you're unliked or shunned you know what i mean like i don't know I think that that's crazy and I just that 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 whole just that whole scene just really got to me and it's interesting because we never get a response from the teacher it's it she says this really you know um Angela is asked basically if she's depressed or if something's going on that there is concern about And she basically says she's having an identity crisis, you know, she doesn't know who she is and she's tired of pretending to be this person that everyone else thought she was. And it's painful and she's saying this and there's no response. And I kind of feel like that's, that's also realistic because you can say these things to people who do really care and do really want to know but what's the right response what is the thing that makes it better how 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 is their help it's just i don't know being human is hard i just uh, yeah Okay, so Ricky and Rayanne and Angela are going to try to go out to a club. Um, Tino is, is you know, going to get them in because they're underage, but he can do it because he's Tino. <laughs> and um, this was really uncomfortable. Again, no one else in my research, I saw nothing brought up about this. And I thought it was really weird. I don't know. Maybe it's because my, my, my life was different. Um, but yeah, so this was, this was strange. But when Angela wants to go out with Rayanne and Ricky, she tells her mom that Ricky's cousin can drive. Her mom responds to this part with, I find Ricky confusing. And it's said in a very skeptical and condescending tone. And I just, as soon as it happened, I was like, oh, okay. So funny. It's like funny how like 30 years later and we, uh, we as a society haven't really gotten any better with not making how someone else feels or dresses about our own comfort. Um, Because Patty's confusion about Ricky is that he wears eyeliner 
and he's, you know, feminine a little bit. Like, not even really. He's more androgynous, honestly, um, by today's standards. Like, definitely just, like, slightly androgynous. But it's just... I don't know. I just... It's not about you. (laughs) Like, it made me so mad that she was like, I find Ricky confusing. Well, that's, that's not anyone else's problem, Patty. Like, that's your problem. That, that's a, a you thing. And I feel like a lot of people nowadays need to also hear that. Whether it be about gender identity, sexuality, you know, hair color, um, weight people, anything. Because people have a, a opinion and are offended about all of it. Always. And like, it's insane. Because none of it has anything, literally nothing to do with you. Like, your comfort is not my problem. And it's not Ricky's problem. And it's not you know, Sally down the street or Sal down the street. It doesn't matter. It's not. Your comfort is your own issue. I just, and you don't have to understand. You don't have to understand. You can be confused. No one, no one really cares. I mean, to be honest, I just, it really, like, it really makes me mad. I, this whole, this episode was, a roller coaster of emotions, if I'm going to be honest, because like I said, I still, you know, it brings me back to feeling like that 17 year old girl who was watching it going through the same stuff. But now I'm a 46 year old woman living in the time that we do now. And I just, uh, just Patty makes me angry. <laughs> But so at this point, Angela responds with, okay, so maybe he's bi, who cares? His cousin can still drive. And her mom, her mom's voice raises and she basically yells, what? He is what? Do you hear these terms she's throwing around? Bi? That's Patty talking to Graham, who's standing there during this argument. And I just... Uh, okay. So Angela's little sister, Danielle, chimes in. It means bisexual. Her mom says, how can he be bi? How can he be bi anything? He's a child. He's obviously very confused. And Angela says, no, he's not confused. The mom again says, he wears eyeliner. Dad responds to this with, He does? He wears eyeliner? Well, Angela says, I thought you were on my side. And Graham answers, I'm not on anybody's side. Where Patty then rebuttals with, Graham, grow up, choose a side. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Oh my god. Like, the amount of cringe and just holy what the fuck fuck is going on I can't I can't even like I cannot convey to you how this made me feel this scene and I just what and again it's even more disheartening because almost 30 years later (laughs) we are basically hearing the same conversations And I just, it's freaking upsetting. It really is. Like, I would have thought by now, being a middle-aged woman, that things would have improved. That tolerance would be better at this point. That acceptance would be a thing. Like, tolerance. Fuck tolerance. Just accept. It has not... You shouldn't have to, no one should be tolerated for being. Like, just, ugh. See, I'm even pissing myself off right now. Like, I just, ugh. If people are not hurting anyone else, if everyone involved is of age and it's consensual, who fucking cares? It's not your business. 
you and your fucking ridiculous just I'm offended by shit that I don't get and I don't want to do is just it's just so much I can't like I'm getting upset (laughs) I'm starting not to be able to make coherent conversation here because it's just it's upsetting it really is and screw that I just no you know I just ugh. buy was a thing back then (laughs) <laughs> like it definitely was a fucking thing back then it wasn't new it wasn't some new fangled freaking wording like i just all of my entire high school career it was a thing in junior high we knew what it was like i just i can't i can't it's ugh. So yeah, so let's move on before I have an aneurysm over this because I really like my foot's going. I'm like warm and sweaty now. <laughs> like, ugh. Um, but yeah. So the next part is Angela leaves to go and meet up with Rayanne and Ricky to go to the club. And she changes, she leaves the house and she changes in the bushes and does her makeup by the streetlight while Brian Krakow does circles near her on his bike and berates her for changing and being too cool now. And when I say that that was an exact replica of points in my life, like legit, um, I used to put makeup on starting in junior high, actually, I would put makeup on in the bathroom and then wash it off before I went home. Um, Clothes, we definitely, we wore, you know, the buttoned up, um, buttoned up flannels and then would have like a body, a sexy bodysuit or, you know, a small tank top or cami or whatever thing underneath it. Um, we would go to our friends' houses and read their closets. Um, Amy was a big, big thing when it came to fashion. Uh, she helped usher <laughs> me into not little kid clothes, basically, which was really nice. And um, it was all on the DL. My parents, I know they knew a little bit of it, but they definitely didn't know as much because we did. We did all that stuff. We got changed in the bushes or in the back of the truck or at a friend's house or in, you know, behind a shed or whatever the case may be, on the bus even. Um, And we did our makeup so they couldn't see it. And that's just how it was. And I also had um you know the neighborhood boys there were two two of them that grew up with me and they would literally circle their bikes at the end of the road and like look at my house (laughs) um yeah and then Once I did start hanging out with the people that I started hanging out with, I was still on the bus with one of them. And he would, you know, ask me the same thing. Like, do you think you're too cool now? Or like, what are you doing? And like, all this stuff. It was, it was so, that, so that scene was very, very reminiscent. As her ride pulls up, Brian says to Angela, You're not stupid. Don't act like it. It's a stupid act. Her response, everyone's an act, including you. And, you know, it goes along with what she kind of said to the English teacher. And it all kind of being a facade and just people doing things to make other people happy. And yeah, yeah, I really, you know, that's a theme of... I don't, maybe the show, but at least this first episode of, you know, not being that person that everyone else expects you to be and the freedom that that brings. They get to the um, club and they can't get in because Tino is nowhere to be found. And so they just hang out in the parking lot and drink 
and they have a great time and they're laughing and whatnot. And then they're walking around and these older guys kind of start flirting with Rayanne. She flirts back a little bit and they start manhandling her. And like right, right in the parking lot, like grabbing her and kind of whatever, like you can tell that it's going to end up being not a good situation. And so the cops show up and no one really gets in trouble. He just brings the girls home and Rayan is like fall down drunk. Um, Angela's obviously also drunk, but not like Rayan is. And this cop just brings them home. Like, what even? <laughs> like, oh my god. Luck, 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 luck. Like, the cop brings Rayanne home first. And there's no one there. Her mom's not there. And he, like, guides her up the stairs as she's stumbling and puts her in her house. Like, who, who does that? No. And then he brings Angela home. And he doesn't even bring her to her house he like stops away from her house and lets her out doesn't bring her there and gives her to brian for safekeeping like who is this cop what is happening and that's that's not no <laughs> like no and i'm not saying that like cops you know would arrest us because they didn't i definitely had run-ins with police um i know my friends did too i can't really think of many who got arrested i um you know some did along the way if they had like paraphernalia or you know drugs on them but anyone who was caught drinking like we'd have to dump our our beers or whatever um that was definitely a thing there was definitely parties that they'd break up and they would take people down to the station or they'd call their parents and have them pick them up. There were a few parties um, at this. We used to go to this like mountainside and into the woods. It's in the book if you've read it. Um, it was called The Overflow and that's actually its real name. I didn't change that because it is no longer there. It doesn't exist anymore. So we used to go to the overflow and we'd have huge parties there. And it got to the point in senior year that it was no longer contained in in the woods. Like there were rows and rows of cars from other people telling other people and telling other people we had people from like three or four surrounding towns come to this party spot it was that good but the cops would show up there a lot because it became a well-known place and a lot of times they would just kind of let people leave um which i guess is is pretty cool and i guess reminiscent of this but if someone was taken if someone was taken into their custody, whether it was arrested or not, they definitely didn't just like leave us at empty houses or, you know, just drop us off at the side of the road. Like your parents definitely were contacted. So that was kind of, kind of weird, but you know, whatever, small, small little thing, but it was just something that stuck out. So Brian asks what happened after the cop leaves and Angela says, these guys started hitting on us. And he says, like sexual harassment? And she responds, like guys. And oh, if that does not, just in a little cute little package, wrap up how a lot of the 90s experience was and you know I've talked about it here and there and I think I've mentioned it even today we grew up in a very male dominated male toxic time like there's just 
no way else to say it. And that is not to say that there aren't good and decent men and boys from that time. Because there absolutely freaking lutely were. Like, not everyone was a scumbag. I And I, I really need people to understand that. However, the majority and the loudest and, you know... <sighs> A big part of the experience. Yeah, they were. They were like that. We were meat. And we were toys. And they were the kings. And that's just kind of how it was. You were a guy. If you were a cool guy. If you were an older guy. You were a stronger guy. It just... You... Pretty much kind of had reign of the world, and a lot of them thought that that included control over women and girls. And yeah, so that that hit hard. That line hit hard. So yeah, and then you know, they just kind of walk around their neighborhood in the middle of the night and they just they're talking and whatever. And it's not even the conversation that really stru- stuck out to me about this. It was really just, yeah. I, I mean, I can't tell you how many nights um, just myself and Kim, especially Kim and I used to sneak out of her house all of the time. She lived in a raised ranch and there downstairs was a rec room we'd stay in the rec room and then when we were pretty sure everyone was sleeping we would open one of little sliding windows and we'd sneak out and we would walk all over town I mean all over town at god awful hours of the night and I mean to truck stops to neighborhoods you know to it was just we we did a lot, a lot of that walking to, um, to meet people, to spray paint stuff, to just I, I smoke cigarettes. Like we just, we snuck out a lot. And, um, and then later, you know, at other houses, we didn't have to sneak out so much. <laughs> we would just go out. Like I know at, um, Amy's house, we would, leave and she lived near a pretty busy street and on that busy street there were a couple places that were open 24 hours like diners and it was awesome we would just you know go get coffee in the middle of the night um or you know go get pancakes or french fries or whatever and we could smoke inside too so I was big with the cigarettes. Um, (laughs) Amy wasn't a a cigarette smoker, but like pretty much everyone else was. I don't think Anne smoked. I don't know. I don't think Anne smoked, but I could be wrong about that, but I don't think so. But most of us did smoke. So we would just, you know, in the middle of the night, go out and find a diner and go in and smoke and drink coffee. (laughs) It was fantastic. So it was cool cause to see that scene with them walking around because that I don't think that happens very often. I mean, it's not safe. I wouldn't do it now. <laughs> like the world is crazy and insane. So yeah, and then um, you know, so when they're on their walk, they um, Angela sees her dad with a woman, and they seem very friendly. So she goes and she goes home and. She has a moment where she's looking in the mirror and she's got all this makeup on and she's just, you can tell that she's just questioning everything in life. She's questioning her family because her father is her favorite and um, she's questioning, you know, her friends and she's questioning herself and what does she do? What does she do? She crawls into bed with her mom. She just gets in there and she hugs her and Patty hugs her back and Angela cries and just they hug each other and embrace and it's they're getting comfort from each other. And that's just 
that was such a beautiful moment because the reality is that even when you aren't getting along with your your mom, she's still your mom. You still want that closeness. You still want that. And as someone who was estranged from my parents for a little while back in the day, um, I can say that's, yeah, you know, I I didn't want or need my mom supposedly but I did and I still do you know um we live 3,000 miles away so it is what it is but yeah so that was it was a really just it was a beautiful scene it just shows the vulnerability and the connection that that relationship has and I think that it's probably true for most mother daughters so yeah but that's that's kind of it that was the episode that was episode one um I'm excited to go through the rest of them I don't know if you guys are interested in going through the rest of them with me but we'll see we'll see what happens um yeah so I guess that's about it and boop boop be doop And that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you so much for joining me today for Naive in the 90s, the podcast, and lots and lots of my so-called life talk, like an hour and a half of it. Um, But I do hope you come back next week for an all new episode and make sure to follow so you don't miss it. For questions, comments, feedbacks, or contributions to the conversation, send me a message at naiveinthe90s at gmail.com or connect with me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube with the handle at naiveinthe90s. And of course, don't forget to grab your copy of Naive in the 90s, the creative nonfiction book based on real life diaries from the early and mid 90s. Follow along as a high schooler tries to navigate life, friends, relationships, and of course, the raddest era ever. And be on the lookout for some merch coming soon. Thank you again for joining. Hope to see you next time. Peace and love, my dudes.